Welcome to Sardar TV. I'm Vaishali Jain. We're excited to have David Stillman join us today. David is co-author of two best-selling books. He's contributed to various publications, including the Washington Post and the New York Times. And he's been featured as a generational expert on several television shows. And today, he's here to tell us about his latest book, Gen Z at Work. David, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. So tell us why you decided to write this book. Um, I wrote this book with my Gen Z son because there's a dialogue that I did not see enough people having. I mean, if, you know, if you look in the media, there isn't a day that goes by where we don't hear something about the millennials. Millennials, 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 the most talked about generation in history for a host of reasons, but no one's realizing that there's a new generation. The leading edge is already in their early 20s. Gen Z born 1995 to 2012. 72.8 million strong, a large generation that no one was talking about. And I realized that if we don't pioneer this dialogue, we're going to treat Gen Z like the millennials and it'll backfire. So we really want to put Gen Z on employers and organizations radar. Mm -hmm. So who would benefit from reading this book? I think a host of people. Uh, for sure, organizations and leaders that are trying to keep an eye on their workforce. We have a new generation, like I said, the leading edge of Gen Z is graduating college this spring. And so how do we recruit them in? I also think there's a big advantage for millennials themselves. Millennials are no longer the new kids on the block. They're stepping into management. Who are they going to be managing? Gen Z. And millennials themselves run the risk of just assuming, oh, this next cohort's going to be just like me. And I think there's vast differences between the two. And while, you know, I'm no parenting coach, I'm, I'm no Dr. Phil, uh, I do think parents get a lot out of understanding what is my child going to be um, as an employee, employee and to help even mentor and coach their Gen Z kids as they enter the workplace. Tell us a little bit about um, some of the events that have shaped the way Gen Z thinks and operates. Sure. Well, the nice thing about generational history is that each generation has its own events and conditions that result in their own generational personality. So if we take a look at Gen Z, one big one is parenting. So to put in perspective, the baby boomers parented millennials, and now we have Gen Xers who have parented Gen Z. And boomers and Gen Xers have parented very differently. So one big uh, influence on Gen Z has been their Gen X parents. Gen X parents have pretty much said to them, there's no such thing as a participation award. There's winners, there's losers. It's a very tough world out there. And that has resulted now in a generation that's way more competitive, very independent. But that parenting style of almost tough love is one of the bigger influences on Gen Z. Can you first outline the different ages or the years that the different gen workforce generations um, form? Absolutely. So starting with the traditionalists, they're born before 1946. While not a lot of them are still in the workplace, you'll still find a lot of workplace cultures uh, that have very traditionalist values. So I often say, you know, they might not be as many traditionalist bodies around, but you might have a traditionalist culture. So I don't like when we see, I see a lot of organizations put them out to pasture. Uh, but so pre-1946, that's the World War II generation. Um, we call them traditionalists. Then we had a great big baby boom happen, so that's the name baby boomers, uh, 1946 to 1964. So this is a civil rights, human rights, uh, Vietnam generation. Uh, then came my generation, I'm a generation Xer, 1965 to 1980. Um, much smaller generation. And what suddenly happened is all these institutions that traditionalists and baby boomers have done such a good job building and taking to the next level, well, Gen Xers, we watched them called into question. So then suddenly we had a very skeptical generation come along. Um, following uh, Gen X were the millennials, originally called Gen Y. They didn't like that name. They wanted a different name, so the society went with millennials. Uh, born 1980 to 1995, uh, children of the baby boom. This is a very collaborative generation, which I'm sure we'll be talking more about. And now we're at Gen Z, born 1995 to 2012. Tell us what some of the main differences between millennials and Gen Z so, you know, one I mentioned is different parenting, but what we find is, you know, millennials were told by their baby boomer parents, hey, if we all pitch in together, you know, we can all win. And what we ended up with is a very collaborative generation. I mean, millennials are the most collaborative generation. It's just amazing if you watch a group of millennials, how they can instantly just form a group, pick out who's best at what, and get the job done. Very different than Gen Z. Gen Z was told, it's a tough world out there. You know, there's going to be a lot of people who want your job. 
And suddenly we saw collaboration turn into competitiveness. And I anticipate a lot of clashes between a very collaborative millennial generation and competitive Gen Z generation. So that's a big one. Uh, another one, take that step further, what you find is that millennials like to think in teams, work in teams, work in groups. Gen Z, not so much. Independent thinkers. 71% of Gen Z said they believe the phrase, if you want it done right, then do it yourself. So again, what we're going to find is a lot of collaborative millennials with group think, a lot of team meetings are going to turn off Gen Z that might be a little bit more, tell me what I need, I'm going to go away and get it done. It's not that they're disloyal, it's not that they're not team players, they just have a very different style. Um, we're even going to see this play out in the office space. If you think about how most offices have been designed lately, it's that open office concept, right? A lot of that. Well, that's to cater to collaborative millennials. Gen Z walk in and they feel it looks like an airport. It's just way too busy and in fact only 8% of Gen Z said they like open office concept. Um, so those are a couple of the key differences we are seeing. Another one I would add is that uh, millennials, very idealistic and optimistic, comes from their boomer parents and so they came to work wanting to change the world. You know, everything they do they want to move the needle on something. Gen Z still wants to change the world, don't get me wrong, but they put the top of their list pay. You know, I want to earn a good salary, it's a little bit more survival mode post-recession. Um, so I think these big, grandiose missions, while Gen Z will you know, be hopefully excited about, I think they're going to be more realistic and pragmatic and also say, well, let me earn a living at the top of their list. Tell us a little bit more about how Gen X, the parents of Gen Zers, have helped shape the role, the, the values and the attitudes of Gen Zers. Absolutely. I think one of the best things, now granted I'm a Gen X parent, so of course we think we did it brilliantly, but I think one of the best things that Gen Xers did with their Gen Z kids is they said there's winners and there's losers and we don't all get a participation award. And there's a lot of joking about that, but that, you know, is a very powerful message because they're going to enter the workforce and realize, you know, that if so-and-so gets a raise, we don't all get raises. You know, this is really a competitive environment out there. And I think that message has made Gen Z come to work and realize I gotta work hard. In fact, I'm so happy to report 76% of Gen Z said I'm willing to start at the bottom and work my way up. We haven't seen this level of dues paying maybe going as far back as even the traditionalists. So that, I think that's a great value that Gen Xers have instilled um, in their Gen Z kids. What else has um, Gen Xers done? They've said, you know, it's a tough world out there. The recession really hit Gen X hard. Um, their net worth fell by 45% during the recession. And a lot of the dinnertime conversations were not about economic prosperity, that you could be anything from an astronaut to a CEO. I mean, that's what millennials heard. But what Gen Xers heard, tough world out there. It's a, you know, rug can be pulled out from you at any time. So we have a generation now that's a little bit more in survival mode, working hard. Um, Hopefully it doesn't go so far where it's paranoia, but I do think you know, Gen X has really painted a realistic picture um, with their Gen Z kids. Yeah. Well, what's interesting now is that many millennials are gonna start moving into managerial roles. So it's gonna be this, the millennial generation who is managing Gen Z. How is that gonna play out in the workplace since they have such different styles? I, I anticipate, and I've been studying generations for 20 years, some of our biggest generational collisions are on the horizon. Twofold, one is I think because there's been so much attention on the millennials, millennials are used to being even talked about themselves, that people are just sort of not spending enough time getting to know Gen Z. So I think we're gonna treat Gen Z like the millennials and it'll backfire big time. Um, and so the way I think the biggest clash will be millennials collaborative nature against Gen Z's independent competitive nature. And I think, you know, suddenly millennials might feel a little threatened as Gen Z fight for even their jobs, but also that, you know, they're there to really look after themselves. Um, and we run the risk though of accusing Gen Z of not being team players, of not being loyal, and it won't be true. It's just that they're gonna go about it a different way. But some of our biggest collisions, I think, will be this collaborative cohort against a more individual, competitive nature, big time. Tell us how Gen Z defines success. How does Gen Z define success? It's a really good question. And we uh, asked this in a few different surveys, and a few different things popped up. One was pay. You know, They're saying, I wanna make a living. Um, it comes from, it's not that they're materialistic, it really does come from experiencing the recession so much. So this is a generation that really saw the rug pulled out from under them. They also have seen millennials saddled with a lot of debt. So you know, they want to earn a living, so that is going to be something 
that's very important to them. But they also, you know, they want a healthy family. They say, I, I'm not willing to give up everything for my family. So, you know, for a while it was called work-life balance. How am I going to balance the two? Gen Z, they more look at work-life blend. Say, how can I, yes, have a career, but I also need to make sure that family is front and center. So I think as they, you know, launch into their careers, they'll define success that am I able to make a living while still maintaining, you know, my family life. And that is going to be something that they are really going to fight for. Something that Xers, we really were the pioneers of fighting for everything from paternity leave to, you know, saying maybe it's the end of the 80-hour work week. Uh, and that has now carried over definitely into their Gen Z kids. Would you say that Gen Zers see men and women differently and their roles than their parents do? Absolutely. You know, the risk we run oftentimes, and we see it more with women, is that they'll accuse the younger generation of, no, of not appreciating the fact that, wow, you know, you're sitting in a boardroom with a lot of men. When I was your age, you know, I would never even be invited to the boardroom. So they, oftentimes I'll hear, you know, baby boomer women, you know, criticize the younger generations that they don't appreciate it. And it's really not the case. The fact is that in many eyes, they feel that battle's been fought. Now, we know there's still issues that need to be, you know, dealt with, but a lot of the younger generations see no difference between the two, and they feel equality is there. And so, you know, when they're told, wow, there's as many women here as men, they're sort of like, there should be, you know. So I think the gender fight is one that um, Gen Z, and I'll even say millennials, I definitely think have embraced, and maybe they're moving on to other forms of diversity to fight for. Now, I know your book mentions how, the, you know, baby boomers were known for their helicopter parenting style, but Gen, Gen X has taken it to another level. Tell us what you mean by that and how that's impacted their children. I'm a, as a Gen X parent, I've been fascinated by it. And I don't know if, because on one hand we're saying it's a tough world out there, you need to be independent, and that's sort of contradictory to then, well, I'm a helicopter parent. And so I, what I don't, it's hard to differentiate is, are they doing it truly because they're helicopter parents or it's just become so easy? Because now, I mean, which boomers didn't have this, I can literally pull out an app and I can tell you where any of my kids are right now. So I think because it's just at their fingertips, they're keeping an eye on their kids. And so they've taken it to a new level, I think because tools have been handed to them to say, you know, here's how I can monitor everything from your whereabouts to your bank accounts to, um, you know, all the aspects of their lives. However, I will say in a lot of our focus groups and discussions with Gen X parents, they're not looking to solve the problem. Where we saw baby boomers take it a little bit too far is we'd hear stories about a baby boomer calling the boss to complain about their child's review, um, showing up even at the workplace. We heard a lot of those stories. I'm sure you've covered some of them you know, over your career, but we're not seeing that with Gen X. Gen X you know, will say, this is your battle to fight. They'll still coach their kids, as I would hope all parents would. I would hate to ever knock a parent for coaching their child, but I do think that Gen Xers are drawing a bit of a line for how far they will take it. But yes, it's right at their fingertips, so there's a lot of monitoring happening. Right, right. But it is, I see, it is very different. Right. I, yeah. it, again, it's, I think they've, we've just made it so easy. Who wouldn't? You know, who wouldn't monitor? It's right there. Gen Z's formative years, as you had mentioned, were, uh, they saw the worst with um, the recession. Absolutely. Would you say that this makes them constantly fearful? I think it puts them in more in survival mode, realizing that, you know, I'm going to constantly have to fight for things. I think it's a generation that realizes they're going to have to work hard, 76% willing to start at the bottom, work their way up, willing to pay dues. Uh, I, I think a lot of their fear, you know, is maybe a little bit more in security. This is a generation that's walking through metal detectors to get to high school. So I don't know if their fear is as much of the recession. I think they're going to see the highs and the lows. But I think fear for them is a little bit more on the terrorism front in terms of like, wow, these are things that used to happen far away, getting closer and closer to home, malls, stadiums, you know. And so I think that, and even cyber terrorism. So I think that's where I'm finding a little bit more of where their fear lives. I think because they watch their parents even get through a recession, I think they have the attitude, we can do it too, and I'm going to fight really hard for it. If anything, I think it's made them tough. Um, not scared, but on the fear front, I do think terrorism front and center. So about 47% of millennials are already parents. Tell us about what their parenting style is like and what we can almost expect from the, the next generation after Gen Z. 
Um, I've done very, I want to be a little research into that, but what I do know is historically a generation will parent uh, almost as a rebellion to the generation that came before them. So we saw Xers, for example, say, all right, baby boomers, that participation award you gave out, that's dumb. You know, there's winners, there's losers. So now I think millennials have watched how our generation is parented and want to change things up a little bit. And one big one that I believe is that millennials will be pushing for what I call a digital detox. They watched a lot of us Xers, you know, driving and they'll look in the back seat of a minivan and see, you know, Gen Z kids holding an iPad or watching video. And so I think millennials are really going to work well with their kids to say, you know, let's put the technology away, talk face to face, actually play with toys that don't light up, that don't have a battery. Because um, there's a lot of, you know, psychologists who have said, you know, that stimulus is too much um, and can cause some challenges. And so that's one area that I really believe millennials will do a great job of sort of maybe doing it different than what we did. Based on what you just said, do you have any inclination or any predictions of what the future workforce might be like based on this? Beyond um, the Gen Zers. The Gen Zers. You know, it, if millennials really tell the collaborative nature uh, into their kids. I think, again, we could see that clash if we've got hard charging, you know, Gen Z that now have made it into management saying, let's go, go, go. And suddenly comes a generation that like, wow, can't we all pitch in together? I think Gen Z could accuse this next generation of being wimpy, of being, no, come on, you know, where's that hard fighting attitude? But again, these are just, who knows, these kids are oh so young. Um, hopefully, which, which is starting with Gen Z, a return to face-to-face -face communication. One of my you know, most surprising findings in our national study we did for Gen Z at work was we asked Gen Zers, how do you want to communicate? 84% said face-to-face. -face. And I think that a lot of that hopefully will even continue with the millennial kids, the, the kids of the millennials, sorry, that they're going to want a lot of that authentic face-to-face -face communication. Tell us about how the economy has an impact on the various generations and their outlook. Absolutely. I mean, th let's just let's start with the millennials. I mean, when, when millennials were in high school, it was the tech boom. It was people, you know, starting in garages, turning into these amazing businesses. Anything was possible. And they had baby boomer parents on top of that telling their millennial kids, you can be anything you want to be, a lot of self-esteem. So how did that play out? You know, millennials came into the workforce really believing anything was possible. Um, they often were accused of being entitled. Uh, I have a hard time with that because oftentimes the same people who are complaining about millennials being entitled, the same people who raised them. Uh, and so they came to work and the attitude was sort of felt, oh, this job's lucky to have me. Um, and anything's possible because I could go and do anything. Well, then came, as we know, the recent Great Recession. And that's what a lot of the dinner conversations were uh, for Gen Z. It was really interesting in that a study was done that looked at millennials when they were in high school and said, what are you most concerned about? And the typical answer was, believe it or not, like, am I popular? How many likes do I have on Facebook? It, very classic of a teenager. However, when that same question then was asked years later to Gen Z, what are you most concerned about? The number one answer was the economy at a young age. So while, you know, it puts it on the radar early, part of me gets a little concerned it's forcing them to grow up very quickly and miss out on maybe some of that teenage angst that we all go through. Uh, but this is a generation now, Gen Z, who had a struggling economy, and they had Gen X parents, you know, who had the rug pulled out from under them. Well, their messages were not anything is possible. It's like, it's a tough world out there. So how does that play out? Now we have a generation that's a little bit more, feels like they're in survival mode. And it's tough. Um, my son Jonah, who co-authored the book with me, makes the analogy that you know millennials, if you look at entertainment, they had Harry Potter, right? You go to this mystical world and you create spells, you fly out on brooms, it's a, just a fun time. And his generation had Hunger Games. You, you know, against the world, post-apocalyptic, you know, almost a little messed up. But, um, you know, that dynamic kind of, I think, actually does do an interesting analogy of what it was like uh, for these two generations growing up. Generally speaking, how would you characterize Gen Z's personality? It's interesting. One of the a few key traits I'd put out there, one is everything is hyper-customized for them. So this is a gen, when we were growing up, the goal was to try to fit in with the rest, because that's what you do as a teenager. You kind of want to fit in and be cool. 
complete opposite with Gen Z. Their goal has been, how do I stand out from the crowd? Everything from their Twitter handle to you know, their playlists that they have, their Snapchats. Um, they, they don't just go buy Nike shoes anymore at the store. They go online and design their own pair. So everything's been hyper-customized. How will that play out at work? They now show up at work and they want hyper-custom careers. 56% of Gen Z want to write their own job descriptions. You know, so I think one would be that everything should be hyper-customized. Um, another big trait that I would say of Gen Z is FOMO, the fear of missing out. So here's a generation that is connected to their feeds 24 hours a day, seven days a week. At any time, they can pull out their phone and see what their network of hundreds, if not thousands, are doing. And I think there's going to be ups and downs to that. The upside is that this is a generation that will come to work and want to streamline things. They feel the rest of us overthink things and they're going to make, if we don't hurry up, someone else is going to do it first. And I think that's going to be great for the workplace. They'll look at processes and procedures and be like, you could do this a lot quicker. So I think that's going to be great. I think the downside is at all times, they're going to realize, wow, maybe I could be doing more at work. I just saw this friend's doing that. I saw another friend's doing this. And so I think that fear that they're missing out on something is going to really sort of make them feel, am I falling behind at work? We know that 75% of Gen Z would look for a place of employment where they could have multiple roles at the same time. So that's like, why can't I be in PR two days a week and marketing the other three days a week? And millennials push for faster career paths. Gen Z will want them fast, but now they're saying, I want multiple career paths. And so those are a couple of traits that I think are going to be very unique for this generation as they now enter the workforce. So because of rapid technological advances, Gen Z lives in a world where physical and digital have been eliminated. Tell us about this and what kind of impacts this has on the society and in the workplace. Um, well, this is we, the trait we use in our book is fidgetal. And it really is where the rest of us have blurred the lines between physical and digital, they've completely eliminated it. So now we have a generation that you, we say whether they're adding you know, to cart on Amazon or literally at the grocery store, it's one and the same. I think a lot of businesses, what they do is they, we've got our digital strategy and we've got our physical strategy, two very separate. And Gen Z says it should be one and the same. You know, take something like retail, right? Let's say someone goes to the store and they buy something. And we might, oh, well, that was purchased, you know, in store. Little do we know the night before they had done all the shopping online, but just wanted to go touch it, you know, and feel it. Well, was it really, does shopping, did it really happen in the store? And Gen Z's mind, no, I went shopping online. I just went to buy it at the store. Or it might be the complete opposite. I went in the store, I saw it, and I touched it, but I just wanted to think about it. Then I went home that night and I ordered it. Well, that got credited as an online purchase. Yet, you know, to them, no, I bought it in store. So I think a lot of people are going to have to try to make those touch points really one and the same. Places like Warby Parker, a great brand, have done a really brilliant job, I feel, of looking at online and physical as one and the same. And that's something that I think is going to carry over. Um, another aspect I find really interesting in the digital world is how Gen Z communicates. So this is a generation now that thinks in symbols, not in words. Why? It's the emoji generation. Right? The 2015, I love this, word of the year was the tears of joy emoji uh, for the Oxford Dictionary. And they were talking to us how it really caused a generational storm. The older generation's like, that's not a word, you're ruining the dictionary. But the younger generations were like, you know, you're really capturing, you know, the essence of our time right now. That is a word. And so I think if we look at how that'll play out at work, communicating in symbols, not words, I think it's going to create some challenges. Because historically, when we communicate in the workplace, the goal has been black and white. You no room for gray. You know, you cross T's, you dot I's. When you start introducing something like an emoji or symbols, there's a lot more ambiguity, a lot more room for interpretation. Um, you know, if a Gen Zer were to send you an email and say, "I sent the client the proposal," and then had the tears of joy emoji at the end, and what's if you weren't up on that emoji, you're gonna be like. Are you sweating? Are you crying? Did something go wrong? And suddenly it creates all this ambiguity that wasn't intended. They were just trying to enhance the communication. So it'll create some ambiguity and you know, some room for interpretation, but I think it could also bring a level of just you know, fun and maybe creativity to what has traditionally been very corporate communication. So I think there's room for both, but that's, I think, one aspect how fidget will play out. How will and how has Gen Z shaped the workplace when it comes to technology? 
the leading edge are just graduating, so we're seeing a lot of internships. It's actually interesting. There are some companies that are realizing, you know, the difference between a college age kid and a high school age kid when it comes to technology. Their knowledge is not that different. So a lot of workplaces are being savvy, and they're reaching out to high schoolers as internships. What does that do? It puts their place of employment on the radar earlier. Because a lot of these organizations want to be able to pull in that workforce. And too often, I think we get on the radar a little late. You know, you're a junior in college. You've already made some decisions. But if you're in high school, you're still trying to figure out what you want to do. So a lot of these smart organizations are realizing, hey, there's a tech-savvy person. We can get on their radar earlier and get the same level of output from them. Um, so I think that's one aspect. Another aspect is that, you know, typically when something new hits a workplace, it starts at the top. I know the most, I've been here the longest, and yet this is probably the first time in history where the younger generation knows more than the rest of us and will lead the way. And that switches the whole paradigm because usually, like I said, the older you are, you know more, and here's a situation where we're going to have to really lean on the younger generations to pioneer. And Part of, I mean, a lot of what we're doing is saying, hey, world, you need to be educated on Gen Z. Well, we also have to do a lot of work with Gen Z to say, here's how the other generations work. Um, and that's why, you know, I've brought my son into this project because it's important for Gen Z to know it's not out with the old and with the new. You can bring something new to the workforce, but you need to know how do you communicate that with a collaborative millennial, a skeptical Gen Xer, you know, a baby boomer that's, you know, rounding out their career. It's really important if you want to make this happen that you figure out how you can communicate with the other generations. What are some factors that Gen Z is going to look at before deciding where they're going to work or whether to join an organization? Great question. One is technology, and that's an obvious one. 91% of Gen Z said a company's technological sophistication would impact their desire to work there. Um, and that's going to have to go way beyond look at our cool website. It's going to be how we're using technology day to day from, you know, meetings that are done via video to, you know, scheduling apps to all those type of things. It's their level of sophistication is pretty high. And I think a lot of companies are still like, hey, look, you know, we're on Facebook and it's definitely dated. So companies need to realize when I say technological sophistication, we might have different definitions here. Uh, so technology is going to be huge. Uh, millennials did such a brilliant job of, I think, bringing this to the workplace, and that is, you know, cause. W what do we stand behind? You know, so if we're going to do something, are we making the world a better place? And we do find that Gen Z is going to carry that baton forward, too. So I think, you know, what impact you have on the world, from your carbon footprint to a cause that you're related to, that Gen Z does put that high on the list, um, much so. Um, diversity is another very important one. They will walk in and they will, you know, notice if this is all white men sitting around. And they believe that they've been told that diversity of everything from generation to gender to race to ethnicity, you know, makes for a better discussion and output. So they will want to join a place that has that because they feel then the ultimate work that they're associated with will be better. What does recruiting look like in the digital age for Gen Z? You know, this is a generation that one thing is going to be video resumes. I think we're going to see a lot more of that. This is Gen Z knows that what you put on your resume on print, you know, looks great, but can definitely be doctored up to look outstanding, where they want that authentic eye to eye. So a lot of Gen Z say, why can't I just create a short, you know, video conversation, send that, and have you look me in the eye and see me? So I think that's one thing that's going to really make a difference. Um, you know, a lot of and a lot of people are doing this, but Skype interviews, you know, don't spend the money and hurt the carbon footprint and fly me across the country when we could just talk, you know, screen to screen, um, things like that. You know, beyond the technical age, I think recruitment's going to have to be a lot of companies, and they did this for millennials who were in search of meaning and change the world, had these over-the-top missions. And Gen Z with a little bit more pragmatic, realistic attitude saying, if you're going to recruit me, like, let's make sure this, your mission is realistic. You are not, you know, curing world hunger. You know, you may be making a dent, but you're not going to solve this. So a lot of these companies, I think, very boomer and millennial attitudes saying, we're going to save the world. Gen Z is like, well, you probably aren't. That's okay. I still want to work there, but let's get real about what we are going to do. Now, do you think that office space will be virtually eliminated in the future with Gen Z, considering that you can work remotely and get a lot of work done, you know, in a space that's not like a, an office? It's a hard one. I mean, there are companies like WordPress, you know, the largest generator of websites today. Uh, they've got, you know, employees all over the world and they don't have a headquarters. And they, uh, you know, they do meet, um, I think it's quarterly for these 
um, team meetings, so they do come together. But in terms of day to day, they don't have some big office to go to. Um, so I do think that Gen Z will put, be more comfortable with that. But we have to remember, a lot of times the ones managing Gen Z will be millennials. And millennials do like to gather in a place they like that open office concept, so I think a lot of the people who will be making those decisions won't necessarily be for it, but we do have a generation who will be comfortable working remotely. Eye to eye, whether you and I are sitting here, or if we had screen to screen to Gen Z, that's still eye to eye. And I'm seeing and I'm talking to you. I don't think we're going to have a generation that wants to completely go away and only text you and not talk to you. As I said, 84% of Gen Z said they prefer face to face to communication. So I think it's going to be a combination of both. That's an interesting dichotomy, the fact that Gen Z is so digitally savvy and, and they do so much of their communicating digitally, yet from your findings, many of them do prefer the face-to-face -face, uh, mode of communication. Why is that? It, I was so shocked by it too. We ran the survey actually two times that 84% wanted face-to-face -face, and in our focus groups, we dug a little bit deeper. It comes from a couple of factors. One, the recent recession has made them you know, a little bit more scared uh, in terms of like, wow, this world's a scary place. But they also see 24 hours a day media, an organization or a leader being called into question. I mean, there's a day we don't see some story break about that. And so they're looking for authenticity. Say, I want, you know, I want to believe you, leader. I want to buy into what you're saying. I need to look you in the eye. So I think a lot of that is just, Eye to eye. I also think there's a level of efficiency. If you and I can sit, talk, hammer it out, then I can go away, you can go away, and I can get the job done too. So I think you know, on a deeper level, it might be more efficient for them just to hammer it out and get it done. Now, we had, uh, you also had touched upon this before um, with hyper-customization, yeah. and Gen, X, Gen Zers have an unprecedented ability to uh, control and create the type of content that they want. And anything from media to politics, Tell us more about this and the other types of things that they have this ability to do. Everything, if you think about it, I mean, it, but everything has been customized for them and they log on to something like Amazon, it's like, welcome back, David. It's like they already feel that, you know, brands and their retail experience has an intimate understanding of who they are and they just assume that when they go to the workplace, it's going to play out that way too, that there's an intimate understanding of who I am. So on the recruitment front, it can't be like, dear blank, We'd like to offer you blank. It's sort of they want something to feel very, very customized. Um, so I think on the recruitment front, that there's an intimate understanding of what you're looking for in your career. Um, what else does Gen Z tell us? They, they want to really customize everything. 56% want to design their own career path. Um, I've seen companies go as far as let Gen Zers now come up with their own job title. Here's what you do. You tell us what you think you should be called. And you know, it sounds very playful, but what these organizations have found is there's more engagement in the job and even more pride because they talk about, I'm a this and this is what I do versus you know, there's a deeper connection between their title and the role that they're playing. So I think customization plays out that way. All said, this level of hyper-custom, and a lot of this comes as a parent of Gen Z, I do have a high level of concern. If we look at how they're consuming their news, at any time, they can pretty much dial in to resources that match their ideals and values. So they can hear whatever they want to hear, which is fine, but they end up living in what we call you know, this echo chamber. You know, so I get to hear whatever I want to hear, and the challenge is when you go to the workplace, you're going to be challenged in life. Someone's going to have a different opinion than you do. And I worry that Gen Z won't be ready for a lot of hearing someone who's got a different viewpoint than them. Uh, and navigating those conversations at work, as we all know, is one of the most important things to learn how to do. And so I think we're going to have a generation that comes into work that might be a little shocked that someone doesn't have the same viewpoint necessarily or how to navigate that dialogue because they've always been able to tap into sources that match their ideals and beliefs. How does this work play out in the workplace when it comes to some of the things, like you said, um, Gen Zers want to uh, shape and create their own roles within organizations. What kind of challenges is that going to pose for companies? Well, one, it is the most fundamental, if you think how we m normally manage employees, it's been on a fairness model. What I do for you, I need to do for everybody. And it's going to be really hard for a generation that doesn't want to be like everybody else. So I think, you know, how do we customize it yet still make it feel fair? And the way I think I personally would need to do this focus on performance. Then, you know, here's your performance measures. If you hit these, then you can be promoted or you could have this opportunity and say, don't, 
they have this opportunity because they hit these eight performance measures. Let's talk about what performance measures you need to hit. And they might be, be completely different. And so if we can get off the fairness conversation and more on the performance conversation, I think that's one way we're going to have to be able to work with Gen Z coming in and being more hi hyper-customized, for sure. Any pros that you can talk about to the fact that they need or are used to having everything hyper-customized, in, specifically in the workplace? Um, I think the pros is that there'll be more of a focus on performance, and so people will be promoted um, based on how they're doing, not based on tenure or fairness. So I think that is a, a big pro, is that we're going to be able to focus on performance. What should organizations and marketers be thinking about when they're actually trying to market products to Gen Z? What are some things that we should be thinking about? That they're not millennials, I mean, first and foremost. And I think acknowledging that, I mean, we'll take something, you know, recently even with the election, one big challenge is everyone accused Gen Z of not voting. Well, no one mentioned, you never heard the name Gen Z, and yet the generation was voting for the very first time. You heard about millennials. So I think we can learn from that and say, you know, hey, Gen Z, we know you're out there, and we know you're different. So one, just acknowledging them. We don't see enough people doing that. I think, you know, marketers do a better job of that than employers. So I think they're a little bit ahead of the game in realizing that. Um, the hyper-customization, the more they can feel that this product is designed for them, the better, or the ability to customize it, that is going to be key for Gen Z. One thing that's probably, you know, is pretty obvious is we've got a very short attention span here. The shortest we've ever seen with the generation. They have an eight second attention span. So here's a generation that, you know, you got to catch their attention pretty quick. So how do you do that? A lot, one way is video, but what happens is people then post, you know, these 14 minute videos. We're talking, this is a generation, you know, that's used to very short videos. So I think short, bite-sized media, for sure, and then the more it can feel customized, the better. Talk a little bit about training in the workplace and how organizations should train Gen Zers based on all of this. Great question. Something I'm really passionate about is that typical training has been, you know, we'll have these weekly sessions or maybe it's quarterly. We bring them all together. We share knowledge. And, you know, the model has been sort of sage on stage. I'm here disseminating information. Well, here's a generation, Gen Z, that, you know, has grown up with YouTube. If they want to know something, they log on, they get the information, they move on. So bringing them into a class and just talking at them for a while is going to backfire. Here's a generation that would much rather say, put me in the job, and when I run up against an obstacle, have, give me resources I can tap into, solve my problem and learn it, and then get back to work. So I think it's going to have to be the YouTube mentality where we give them a lot of short bits of information on a lot of different things that when they run into a problem, they can definitely um, learn about it. That being said, I think it needs to be coupled with mentoring, for sure. Remember, 84% want that face-to-face -face communication. So I think savvy organizations are going to say, here's what you need to know, and if you need help from somebody, you know, here's someone who can answer your question. So those people then go from sage on stage to guide on the side, saying, you navigate when you need help, I'm right here, just ask me and I can answer any of your questions. I do think that's going to bruise a few trainers and leaders' egos who are used to being the one, I've acquired all this knowledge, I like sharing the knowledge with you, and now we have a generation that comes along being like, no, I'll tell you what I need to know, um, and then I'll ask for help. And I think the, they run the risk of being accused as being arrogant. It's really not true. They're saying, let me dive in. When I need some, I'll come to help you. They want those mentors and they want that help. But if you're used to being the one that everyone comes to and you're used to the one being the guy or woman that shares all the information, suddenly now you've got somebody who isn't coming to you, I think we run the risk of bruising a few egos in the workplace. We talked a little bit about performance. Tell us how organizations should provide performance feedback and evaluation to Gen Z based on some of the things that we've just discussed. It's going to be hard because on one hand, you know, there's a generation that in high school at any time and their parents have been able to pull up their phones, get an app on exactly how they're doing. So part of it's going to have to be frequency. I mean, I need to be able to see how I'm doing some type of dashboard at all time because I've been able to see when I'm late on an assignment, what my grade is, how I did on that test four hours later. So they're used to that frequency. So this idea of like a quarterly update or you know, even biannual performance reviews is really going to be challenged. So I think part of it's going to be this idea of a digital dashboard that goes to a whole new level for this generation. 
At the same time, they want that face-to-face -face feedback. It's just they don't want long sessions. Think of that bite-sized media approach, that eight-second attention span. So Gen Z say, no, I'll, I'll take feedback even daily, but you know, less than five minutes. So they're looking for these short check-ins, let me know how I'm doing, and we can move forward. One thing I will say though, and this is I'll attribute to the parenting, when millennials entered the workforce, one of the biggest knocks they heard, and I studied this a lot, was they were not ready for constructive feedback. You had baby boomer parents who had told them they're great at everything, who focused more on the things they're great at, the things rather than they weren't. They came to work believing they're great, as they should. Well, then they sat down at that first performance review, got a little bit of constructive feedback, and literally caved. You know, started crying, were upset. And I can't knock millennials. I mean, that's how they were groomed. Uh, and so they weren't ready for it. Well, Gen Z is ready. Xers have told them, you're not all that. It's going to be a tough world out there. So one thing we know about Gen Z is they can handle constructive, straightforward, to the point. Don't beat around the bush. Don't sugarcoat it. Just say it like it is. I worry that a lot of baby boomers, maybe even millennials, will dance around it. There'll be a lot of, you know, padding that comes with the message and Gen Z is going to be like, get to the point. I know I blew it here. Just tell me how and what I can do to fix it. So I think they're going to be looking for a little bit more about how they were parented. And that is straightforward, to the point, honest, and even at times unfiltered. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I've even seen some companies do away with the annual performance review because they've really instilled in their managers and leaders that feedback is not something that we should sort of annualized. It's to be something happening every single day. Uh, employees shouldn't have to sit down once a year with you to find out how they're doing. They should know. And I've seen big companies actually get a, do away with annual performance reviews. Yeah. Tell us about Gen Zers outlook on college and how that compares to other generations. It's a really great question. You know, as I mentioned to you, with this book, we're really excited to pioneer dialogue because I feel the organizations can be proactive rather than reactive. The leading edge is just graduating. But if you were to say to me, is there one industry that's already in reactive mode and behind, I'd say higher ed. Higher ed, I believe in a lot of ways, has missed the value proposition that needs to connect with Gen Z. And Gen Z has watched millennials now saddled with so much college debt. 67% of Gen Z said, I'm worried about college debt. So suddenly, you know, going to college has been called into question. We've talked about there's so many other resources and programs today. We also have 75% of Gen Z said, you know, there's ways of getting a good education other than going to college. So, you know, it's going to play out in a couple of ways. And it's not saying people won't go to college. They might do something like a gap year. We're seeing a lot more, a lot going to trade school. We're seeing a lot of Gen Zers look at a community-based school because of cost to get some of those entry levels out of the way and then maybe move on to a four-year degree program. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of that. But they really are believing that college might not be everything. Um, and Gen X parents are playing a role in that. Gen Xers have always been a little bit more down the alternative paths and are open to the idea that you know, your path might look a little bit different. I think for baby boomers, you know, a college degree they had to fight so hard for, they really instilled in their millennial kids that a college degree is the end all and be all. You ask a lot of millennial kids, going to college, you know, it was never not an option. And I think Gen Z are saying there are other options. Now, that being said, uh, Gen Zers who are going to college, a big paradigm shift we had. If you think about, you know, when you and I went to college, at least for me, I went to college to figure out what I wanted to be. I mean, I often joke that I went to college literally thinking I wanted pre-med. I had a little stint in forensics and I ended up with a degree in journalism. I mean, I just sort of found my way. Well, Gen Z feels if I'm going to spend that money, I better know what I want to be. 61% of Gen Z said, I need to know what I want to be in life before I go to college. So think about how that changes the value proposition. We used to say, come to college and figure it out. We now have to be saying to these uh, Gen Zers, hey, you know what you want and I'm going to get you there. So that is a big shift. The other challenge with Gen Z, because they're so focused on getting ahead, surviving, seeing that there's alternatives, is they need to see a better connection between what they're learning and how it applies to the future. And this is where things like I think a liberal arts degree are in question. And I'm a big fan and believer in a liberal arts degree. But I think now we have a generation that's challenging that because they'll maybe sit in class and they'll be learning about Greek civilization, art history. And they're sitting there being like with a textbook that feels old being like, how is this going to help me in my future? I'm spending all this money for what? And so we've seen colleges and universities that are able to incorporate real world experience such as internship programs or exposures to CEOs coming into lecture, 
um, and meet them, have a leg up because Gen Z is able to see that connection they're looking for between what I'm learning and how it applies. Another interesting thing that you talk about is how uh, Gen Zers' viewpoint is a lot like traditionalists when it comes to employment. Can you tell us more? Yeah, you know, obviously times are different. You know, um, Gen Z, you know, traditionalists might be a little offended, like what? You're like, you can pull out your phone. I actually had a map that I read that would get me there. So I mean, I could see why traditionalists might be shocked by that. But some core values we are seeing. One that I. Uh, have touched on would be dues paying. Here's a generation where I said 75% said they're willing to start at the bottom and work their way up. Very traditionalist attitude. Um, comes from the recession as well as Gen X parents telling them it's going to be a hard world out there. Another one is loyalty. 61% um, of Gen Z said I'm willing to stay 10 years at a company. We have not seen that for years and years and years. Now a lot of people say, oh good, they're going to come and they're going to stay. That does not take the ownership off of employees our employers and organizations. We still have to figure out all those things we've been talking about from hyper customization to ways to do feedback to mission driven um, to get them to stay. But if we can create that independent and hyper custom careers, I do believe Gen Z will stick around for a while. But another factor that comes into that is you have Gen Z entering the workplace. They know that life expectancy is pushing 90s into 100 right now. So they know they're going to be working for years and years and years and years and years. So 10 years to them, while a long time, it's not a lifetime. So they'll still have multiple careers because they're going to be working for a long time. That's interesting. That's another, because I feel, I also feel like, you know, as Gen Xers, we were raised by traditionalists, right? So also, although Gen Xers kind of were looking for that alternative path, I wonder how much of the underlying values that our parents instilled in us are actually you know, now going to our children, even though we wanted to do things a little differently. And we struggled to do those things. But, you know, when I read that, I was like, huh, I wonder. I absolutely think, I mean, but at the same time, you know, for us, retirement was still defined at like 65. We still thought you work, 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 and then you stop. But what happened, we saw a lot of our parents stop, depressed, you know, didn't feel they had purpose anymore, we're missing community. So I think a lot of that model that was laid out for us, we were like, ooh, you know, it's not going to necessarily be the case. And so I think we've instilled in our kids this idea, you, you know, you'll be working one form or another, as you should, hopefully you love your work, for years and years and years. So I think the whole idea of a career path has changed. You don't work and stop. You keep working, hopefully reinventing. Um, but in the case of Gen Z, if that means I'm at a company for 10 plus years, you know, they're all in, which comes back to a lot of those traditional values that we haven't seen for a while that employers, I think it's a golden opportunity for employers as well as for Gen Z. Why is it that Gen Zers have a constant fear of missing out? Um, I think one thing to now acknowledge is that I think all the generations now suffer a little bit of FOMO because anyone at any time pulls out their phone and they're like, oh my God, they're on this great trip to Iceland. Oh my God, this person just got a promotion. He just got a car. I think, you know, everyone now, and the reason is, is because we're just, we can see what people are doing 24 seven, you know? And so the problem that challenge we have with Gen Z is it's taking place during their formative years. So while their ideas of the world are shaping, while the rest of us have FOMO, you know, we can maybe read a little bit deeper in it. Uh, well, this generation, you know, it's happening during their formative years. So one concern I have is that, you know, a lot of people post the highlights of their life. And so Gen Z is really seeing everyone's best. They don't know at the same time, maybe someone's having a great day and got a promotion, but a couple of days later got a bad review. Or, you know, maybe their project bombed. You don't see that post <laughs> on social media. So one thing we have to work with Gen Z is to realize you're seeing the highs. And with life, there's highs and there's lows. Let the highs inspire you, for sure, but realize that it's not like that at all times. And so if you're feeling like you're missing out, you know, there's a lot of great things that you're doing as well and that those same people also are having lows. Um, that'd be one thing. Another thing that I think we can work with Gen Z is because, I mean, their networks are so vast and their feed has everything. I need, think they need some help prioritizing. On one hand, if you think of, they're reading a feed about how, you know, somebody just got tickets to a concert, someone got a great score on a test, somebody died. I mean, it's just, it, there's just so many things. I'm like, how do I prioritize what's really important and what's just sort of, you know, fluff that goes away? And to them, it's sort of like everything might feel important and we need to help them decipher what's a priority and what isn't. Um, I think another issue with uh, FOMO and them being so 
dialed in is I think there will be a big difference, especially for businesses, between dialing into a fad and a trend. You might see a lot of people talking about and they might feel, oh, we should be doing this, 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 and this, only for two days later to be dead. And suddenly, you know, the workplace might put some attention on something versus monitoring. Is that really something we're seeing again and again and again and a trend we should pay attention to? And I think workplaces, you know, might be so, oh, wow, this young person, he knows it all. They're hip and cool. Make sure that they're reporting into you a true, you know, trend and not just a fad that you can put some money on that's going to die soon. Because I'm not so sure Gen Zers can differentiate between fad and trend. How is the fear of missing out going to impact career paths? for Gen Zers then? Oh, definitely, I think you know, they're constantly gonna be seeing what everyone else around them is doing. Um, and we touched upon this, but one thing we know is, and millennials have this too, they're gonna want career paths to move at a much faster pace. So that's not a new concept. Millennials pretty much tried to put to bed the idea that it's all on tenure. You put in three years and you move up. You put in three years and you move up. And millennials are saying, no, 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 no. If I've achieved it and I'm doing stuff, I wanna move faster. So career paths, you know, and the attention on speeding them up have happened. Well, now Gen Z is saying, that's not enough. I want multiple career paths. So I think this idea of multiple career paths happening at the same time, 75% of Gen Z said they're interested in that. And this is an area where I feel, whether or not you could actually give someone multiple jobs, I think the idea of having a lot to work on that makes them feel that I'm getting to touch on a lot so I'm not missing out, is where small to medium businesses are gonna have a leg up. Uh, because what do you hear at those places? You wear a lot of hats. Where at large organizations, they're a little bit more siloed. People are in very specific, uh, specific positions. And that may struggle with Gen Z, who's like, I'm only doing this one thing. Well, very important, because you have a lot of people in a large organization who can do the other things. So I do think that's going to play out. Um, the other thing is that you know, at all times, they're going to be tempted. You know, because what happens is you know, maybe they pull up their thing, they looked on LinkedIn, being like, oh, wow, someone just got a job there? That's cool. I've always been interested in that field. and just. Innocently, they reach out saying like, hey, congratulations, how's the job? You know, it's really cool. Next thing you know, it's like, you should apply here. Oh, maybe I should. You know, and so I think they weren't even looking for a job that day necessarily. Next thing you know, they're sort of putting feelers out there. So I think that is something that we're just going to have to deal with. I think we'll be very quick to label that as not being loyal. And I think it's just a sign of the times that FOMO will create, you know, not only constant interest in what others are doing, but now with technology, it's really easy to put it out there and go down that path. Tell us how Gen, uh, Gen Zers are gonna take the freelance economy or the gig economy to a whole other level. A great question. I mean, this is a generation that, you know, if you think about it, for them to start a business is really not a big deal. Within two days, they can have an 800 number, an LLC, a website, you know, a phone number that just transfers to their cell phone. They can go get one of those group offices. I mean, they can start a business literally within two days. So the barrier to entry is just gone. For the rest of us, you know, it was a longer, bigger process. So that's one thing we need to realize. This is so easy to start one. The other thing I think is that, you know, where we call them a freelancer, they would call themselves a business owner. So I think, you know, there's going to be a big difference between that's a freelancer that, no, I own a business. Because for the rest of us, if you owned a business, it was often measured by how many employees you have. How big is that business? Where they see that as wasteful. They'll say, I'm a one person shop here. You know, I'm not a freelancer, I'm a business owner. So I think what we call a freelancer, they're going to call a business owner. Another differentiation. But, you know, for the rest of us, if we looked at starting our own business, it was an either or. Like, either I'm going to go work at this company, or I'm going to start my own business. And we really grabbed, especially Gen Xers, you know, we really looked at starting our own business and what are we going to do. Um, and so the idea of starting your own business, you know, was a big decision. For this generation, it's not going to be an either or, it'll be an and. I'll go work here and I'm going to have my business. And it's called the side hustle has been sort of the term that a lot of people use. Um, Uber has a great campaign, if you look on TV, and it says, like, get your side hustle on, because they're saying, you know, while you're driving around, why not earn? And so Gen Z sort of has this mentality, why don't I have a side hustle? Whether it's Uber, whether it's, you know, I make a product or a service and I sell it on the side. And so a lot of employers hear that, their first reaction, oh, absolutely not. You come work for me, nine to five, I don't want to walk by your desk and find your website up that you're uploading a few things to, you work for me. Very fair fair statement. However, what Gen Z will say, well, then why is it okay for you to email me seven o'clock at night and expect a reply? You know, no one works from nine to five anymore. And I think we're going to have to welcome the side hustle in. Oftentimes, you know, they might, you might walk by their desk and they're uploading some, a minute of their day, but late at night, you know, they're also emailing clients and stuff for you. So I think the idea is, 
if they're getting the job done, we might have to start to embrace more side hustles. And workplaces that do even you know, embrace Gen Z side hustles, I think will find a leg up on recruitment saying, you know, we're fine if you do this, we think it's great. However, we're assuming you're gonna be getting this done too and answering ours. And I do believe Gen Z will be able to do both. However, the other thing I'll bring up is that does bring up the whole notion of non-competes. You know, uh, first of all, you have to look at that side hustle. If it's at all competitive, absolutely not. There's no place for it and I, you know, I would never endorse that. However, you know, if I'm an accountant and I'm making birdhouses on the side, I doubt there's a big competitive barrier there and why not? embrace that. So I think the non-compete discussion does need to be brought up. And I think updated too, because non-competes have always been this long thing that you signed in the back of everyone's minds, like, oh, well, I could always fight that if I needed to. I think non-competes need to be, you know, not so legalized and have more of an authentic conversation about what does that mean and negotiated more so that non-competes could truly stand for something because I think they've been watered down over the years. You talk about the, the drive that Gen Zers have and the difference in the drive between millennials and Gen Zers. Talk about that difference and how companies are gonna sort of work their way around how this plays out in the workplace. It's a very driven generation. I mean, it comes back to the recession. It comes back to Gen X parents, you know, really hammering into how hard they're going to have to work and start at the bottom and work their way up. It comes from watching millennials a little disillusioned that came into the workplace wanting to change the world and maybe find themselves now saddled with the debt and maybe haven't moved the needle as much as they've wanted. So Gen Z is entering the workplace and they are very driven. That'll play out in the terms of they're very competitive. They're going to bring a level of competitiveness internally as well as externally. I mean, the good news is they're going to want to take down the competing company, and what employer won't love that? But suddenly, I think there's going to cause you know some internal clashes as they really fight for each other's jobs and even you know their superiors' jobs. So I think that drive is going to be great to help us stay on the cutting edge and move forward. But it's going to create some challenges internally that we haven't seen in a long time. Can you just outline the overarching themes that HR departments and organizations should be thinking about when they're thinking about what to expect? I think they should read the book, Gen Z at Work. <laughs> Sorry, shameless plug. Uh, but what do I think? I think first and foremost, I mean, it sort of seems basic, but acknowledge we've got a new generation. And history has shown that each generation has its own events and conditions that result in a different personality. So we really shouldn't be so surprised that Gen Z is different than millennials. And you just can't, it's so easy for the rest of us to look at someone under 30, oh, they're all the same. So I think step one is they're gonna be different. Understand what makes them unique. Talk to Gen Z, recognize that you acknowledge that they're unique. Um, and then dial into some of their key traits. How will technology play in? Hyper-customization, we're gonna really have to figure out ways so these careers can feel customized and individualized, not because they're entitled, not because they're spoiled, because everything else in their world has been customized and individualized for them. So in their minds, why wouldn't my career follow that same path? Um, I think we're gonna have to help them through FOMO, that they have a fear of missing out, that no, you come here, you're working for a winning team, you are not falling behind, and we need you to help us stay ahead of the rest. I think that's gonna be definitely key. I do think one great thing that Gen Z will carry the torch with millennials is the impact that we have on society. That when we work, hopefully we can move the needle on some cause. Hopefully that, you know, we could pay attention to our carbon footprint. And I think Gen Z is going to continue to pay attention to that. And it's something that we all need to be paying attention to. And more than anything, um, I think we need to keep our biggest eye on that millennial Gen Z dynamic. Because I think I really predict that we're gonna see a lot of collisions there. So one thing I'd be doing is putting a lot of effort into training millennials on, you know, here's the workforce coming in, how they're different from you, how do you manage your collaborative person, how do you manage someone that maybe doesn't wanna to go to all your team meetings? And so I'd be putting a lot of my effort into training those that are gonna to have to manage them so that, you know, we can be able to bridge those gaps ahead of time. All right, David, well, this was great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. And we'll see you next time on Sardar TV.